Tonight we're going to hear from a wonderful person, Ken Curtis. He's going to talk to us about great white sharks. And I want to acknowledge our sponsors for this lecture series, Gazette Newspapers and the Downtown Courtyard Marriott. Ken is one of our dive team leaders, and he's been with this aquarium since before we opened uh, in June 1998. It's hard to believe that a guy who has had more, more than 5,000 dives was thrown out of two swimming classes by the time he was six because he was afraid of putting his head in the water. But he went on from there, and he went, uh, grew up in Delaware and New York and uh, a variety of other places. The cops were always chasing him. Uh, he, he graduated from Northwestern University with a degree in television and, and radio. And he became the, uh, the manager of a radio station in Richmond, Virginia. And it was there that he got interested in and certified as a scuba diver because there was a promotion that his organization, his radio station, was involved in. He's a NAWI instructor, a National Association of Underwater Instructors in Scuba. He's taught thousands of people over the years, and he's logged more than 5,000 dives all over the world in places like the Maldives, the Indonesia, Yap, Tahiti, Bonaire, Cocos, Alaska, Easter Island, and of course, right here off Southern California. He also has, for more than probably close to 20 years, I guess, been in charge of the fundraiser uh, at the, for the, the chamber, the Catalina Hyperbaric Chamber, and they have a fundraiser every year that we participate in. He's been a leader here, as I said, since before we opened. He's an accomplished photographer and has photos and stories that can be found in the pages of the California Diving News, Sport Diver, Skin Diver, Undercurrent, and other scuba publications. And he also has a monthly newsletter from his dive shop, Reef, Reef, Reef Seekers. He's been a forensic consultant to the LA County Coroner when there are diving accidents uh, and the people, they, the coroner needs some help on the, with those corpses. He also has run in five LA marathons. He says he's run in them. I don't know that he's finished any of them. Have you? He said, yeah. <laughs> but please join me in welcoming the aquarium's own Ken Curtis. Our talk tonight is uh, what big teeth you have. How to dive with great white sharks and specifically down at uh, Isla Guadalupe or Guadalupe Island. So how many of you want to hear about the most vicious predator in the ocean? Okay, so we're going to talk about damselfish. The damselfish is so vicious, you invade their territory, they bite you, thank God they're only an inch long. That's not it? Okay. Then it must be the titan triggerfish. This fish is pissed off its entire life. I had one swim 50 feet to me, bite me in the fin and swim back, oh yeah, what? Okay, it's not that one. Then it must be the red tooth triggerfish where in the aquarium in the tropical reef, We've had them come up and literally bite our mast straps in half. None of those. Okay. I guess it's the great white shark. Yeah. All right. Now, take a look at this lovely face and ask yourself why it is that this animal inspires such fear in us. And most likely, it's because in the back of your mind, you think your encounter with them will end up like this. <laughs> it's only a movie, okay? But it is interesting because great whites for years have really inspired a lot, of, a lot of fear in people. And this is sort of what it's like, and we'll get into the details more, but this is what it's like to, to view them from a cage. So what I want to do is give you just some, some overview stuff on, on white sharks and, and some sharks in general, and we'll get into the specifics of actually diving them down at a place uh, off of uh, Mexico on the Pacific side called uh, Guadalupe Island, which is an easier way to say it than Isla Guadalupe because they tell me I keep pronouncing Isla wrong. Um, I'll let you know I've done this trip uh, three different times and uh, I'm going back again in September. There'll be more about that uh, towards the end. But uh, it's a really, really cool, cool experience. So let's see if we can, can give you just some general information about sharks. First of all, we got 400 species of sharks, more or less, worldwide. Most of them are under three feet long, okay? 
and very few are actually known to attack, and even then it's usually a case of mistaken identity. Um, in fact, we've got some actual numbers. These are, these are real numbers from the last 10 years, in case you're interested. Worldwide, a little over 700 shark attacks. The red number, I chose red because that's the fatalities. I thought that was appropriate. Um, but 59 deaths. So on average, you're talking six deaths from sharks a year. And this is the actual order where the most shark attacks occur. And you'll notice California is way down there towards the bottom with over 10 years, 31 attacks, uh, three fatalities. So the reality is that you probably stand a better chance of getting injured driving home tonight than you do of being injured by a shark. Unless, of course, you get hit by a car driven by a shark, and then all bets are off. But who are the biters? Okay, what species of sharks are biting? Well, tiger sharks are biters, hammerheads sometimes, oceanic white tips. And I'll tell you, I swam with an oceanic white tip in the Red Sea for like 90 minutes, and it was just amazing how curious these animals are. So part of the thing here is a lot of times when you hear about bites and you hear about quote unquote attacks, it is not only a case of mistaken identity, but the shark's just sort of curious. And you know, they can't like poke you with their pectoral fin. All they got are teeth. That's how they check things out. So sometimes that's what happens. Bull sharks actually account for probably more injuries than any other species of shark, because they will exist in both um, freshwater and, and salt water. Uh, lemon sharks have been known to bite, and of course our our lovely guys, the great whites. So those are sort of your, your biters, more or less, six species uh, of shark. But then who are the bites? So the bites fall into two categories. One is snorkelers. Why would that be? On the surface, which means what? They're, well, they're not right, but when you are kicking, the vibrations you send out when you're kicking are similar to that of a wounded fish. So the shark is zooming in on the vibrations gives a bite and goes, oh, I'm terribly sorry. They're real, they really do get embarrassed. So I'm terribly sorry and, and goes away. The other, um, and also a lot of times it's shallow water too. So maybe the people aren't snorkeling, but they're wading around splashing stuff like that. The other category, hunters. Why would that be? Well, the shark is zooming in on the prey, on what they've got, the fish, not the person who got it. Who's the most famous shark bite victim in the world? That would be Rodney Fox. Australian guy, 1963, bitten by a great white shark. Rodney in 1963 on the left, 462 stitches to stitch him up. Rodney in his older days, he's still alive. Now one of the great shark conservationists in the world. What was Rodney Fox doing when he got bitten? Participating in the Australian National Spearfishing Championships. Shark was going for the fish on his hip, got him instead. So the point is that these guys are not mindless hunter biters. They don't just go around and bite you know, every, everything that they can, they can think of. They've really got a personality. They're, the idea of a shark, especially with a great white, have you, you, know, you hear about this black dead eye. Uh-uh. They're, they're looking you over. And it's like, it's interesting, because you wonder, are they looking you over? Yum, yum. Or are they looking you over, hey, how you doing? Nice to see you. Thanks for coming down today. And one of the things that I, that I was telling Jerry at, at dinner that has happened with, with these dives we've done, so I've probably done 100 or more dives, specific dives with great white sharks, as close as three or four inches away, where I have to back up, back, back into the cage. Because the other thing you'll notice with the cages, they have a gap so we can stick our cameras out. And, well, you know, if you're going to stick your camera out, you might as well stick your arms out. And as long as I got my arms out, I might as well put my torso out as well. So sometimes you're hanging halfway out of the cage. And you sit there, and you're going, now I feel very comfortable with these sharks. You know, is that part of their plan? Or is it, you know, so you got to be careful that you don't get yourself into a false sense of confidence. Because again, they are still wild animals. But like I said, they've definitely got a personality. This is a shot from Guadalupe. Take a look. This guy is biting, and we'll, we'll I'll talk more about this in a bit. The burlap sack has a piece of tuna inside. So that's what he's going for. I'm about a foot away from him. But what I want you to notice is his eye. I don't know how well you'll be able to see this, but I'm going to blow it up a little bit. Normally, when sharks bite anything, 
they have a membrane on the outside of their eye called a nictitating membrane. It's a protective cover. And they close that down like a window shade to protect their eye. This guy, that's his eye. And again, I don't know if you can see that well. That's his eyeball. He's looking straight at me as I'm taking the picture. And you can see up there just a hint of the nictitating membrane that he has not dropped down. So, you know, they, again, this idea of they just are mindless hunters, I, don't, I just don't buy into that at all. And in fact, they're very, very social. What we've learned in the last couple of years, this is a, a diagram of some sharks they've been tracking off of the California coast. And a lot of the sharks, especially up in the Monterey area, will go uh, spend time in Hawaii. <laughs> Come on, it's cold in Monterey, let's go to Hawaii and have a good time. Um, but the cool thing is, if you notice right in the middle there, there's this area that's called the White Shark Cafe. And just about every single shark in the area goes to the White Shark Cafe. It's about 3,000 feet deep. And we don't know what they do there. But the thought is that they're like doing some mating, they're doing a little bit of social ordering, that there's something going on. This is their Studio 54 or whatever, that they got to go there. Coachella, if you, know, you don't know what Studio 54 was. But they got to go there and hang out and socialize, and, and then they go, they go on their way. There were, uh, Stanford did a study, six sharks, they tagged them, they followed them. You'll note they went to Hawaii, but you'll note they also went to the shark cafe. So, you know, there's something going on with these animals that we don't quite understand. And that's the other big thing. There's a lot about sharks that we just don't know. And, it, and it's not only true for sharks, true for other species as well. And that's why anytime you get a chance to observe them up close, whether you're a layperson or you know, a scientific researcher, that's a real good thing. So what don't we know about sharks? We don't know where they mate. Um, you, what you want to understand about any, anything is, well, where do they mate? Where are the, the little pups being born? How does that affect the life cycle? Stuff like that. So we have no idea really where, where they mate. It might be the shark cafe. It might be somewhere else. Because the other thing to remember is this is just shark cafes Pacific. There's probably something similar in the Atlantic. We don't know where they pup. There was a lot of excitement over the summer uh, that they think they found a white shark pupping ground in the Atlantic somewhere off of Cape Cod. And that if that's where the white sharks give birth, that would be a cool thing to know. How big do you think a white shark is when they're born, roughly? I'll give you a hint. Five feet, that's very good. Very smart people in the audience tonight. Uh, about five feet. Have you heard of us seeing white sharks off of Hermosa? Redondo, how big are those sharks? Five feet. My guess is they're pupping somewhere around here. That's just a guess. But we don't really know, know those things. The good thing is, by the way, so you're not scared of going in at Redondo and Hermosa now. When they're that young, they're eating fish and other stuff. They're not, they're not thinking about anything like pinnipeds or the big you know, seals and sea lions. That's what they really like. How do these animals navigate? We don't know that. How do they get from San Francisco out to Hawaii without you know, getting lost and ending up in Alaska. One of the thoughts is they, they have uh, sensors in their nose, the ampullae of Lorenzini, great name, uh, and it's very sensitive electrically, and that they can navigate along electrical longitude and latitude lines that are present in the, in the Earth. But we don't, we don't exactly know. How smart are they? <laughs> Maybe smarter than we think. Um, again, don't really know it. And again, it, the hard thing to do is to test out a lot of these things because it's not like we can keep white sharks in captivity. One of the interesting things about being in an aquarium situation is we can observe things in captivity that we just absolutely can't observe in the wild. One thing we, that you may have heard of is we're raising a juvenile black sea bass or giant sea bass. I was up there taking his picture today, about that big. Never happened before. We don't really know what these animals do. So we have a, an opportunity now to see what the life cycle is of, of the giant sea bass or the black sea bass. White sharks, you can't really keep them in captivity. They don't do well in captivity at all. So you don't have that opportunity. So this is just something we, we can't really test out. And basically what we're saying is, what the heck do they do all day? What's on their to-do list? So anytime you could find a place where you know you're going to find white sharks and you know that you can find them rather reliably, that is a great natural laboratory in which to look at them. And 
That brings us to Guadalupe Island, which is a really fabulous place to study sharks, and let me show you why that is. One reason is we know when the sharks are going to be there. These are all great whites, roughly from August to November. Some get there, you know, maybe middle of July, some stay a little bit into December because they haven't gotten their Christmas shopping done yet, but basically that's, that's the time that they're there. The males come in generally early, females come in later. Whether that's for social reasons or mating reasons, not exactly sure. 12 to 20 feet long, all right? So I did one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So 20 feet is about two thirds or so of this row would be my guess. So that's, a, that's the biggest shark. And we saw, and you'll see a picture, we saw one of those. 12 feet is probably about five or six of these, these seats. So these are, these are really big animals. Usually the females are bigger than the males. Um, at Guadalupe, They've ID'd, not tagged, so again, difference between tagging a shark where you're going to put a, some sort of a, a, a tracking device on them and ID them. They've ID'd over 200 individual sharks. And that's cool because then over the years, they can track where they are, who came back, who didn't come back, were they spotted somewhere else, anything, uh, anything like that. At Guadalupe, many times you have visibility over 100 feet, so you can really get a good look uh, at the sharks. When I've been down in the cages, I have seen because you can count, I have seen, I think seven is the record I've seen at one time. Um, and I think the most they've ever seen is, is nine at one time. Then that's just within our range of visibility. You know, there could be nine more at 200 feet, but we can only see 100 feet. And for those of you who don't dive, 100 feet is like really good visibility. To put it in perspective, the average visibility here in California offshore, meh, 20 feet or so, so we might not see the entire length of a great white shark. Uh, get out to Catalina, maybe you're dealing with 40 feet. So 100 feet is, is, is cool stuff. The other thing at Guadalupe is they've got um, pinniped, a big pinniped colony there. So there's, there's definitely a lot of um, food there if they want to go for it. And what we definitely see is we see sea lions with, uh, you know, with bite marks and stuff like that. So the bottom line is Guadalupe is a great place to go. Uh, there are about five dive boats that will take, you know, lay people, commercial, uh, it's a commercial operation. You don't necessarily need to be a certified diver to go because some of the cages are surface based, so you don't have to uh, be scuba diving. Some of them are submerged cages. But let me show you how we get down there. So we're up here in Los Angeles. We generally go, most of these operations are based in San Diego, but they actually leave out of Ensenada. So we end up getting down to Ensenada, and then you got to go to Guadalupe, which is down there. And that is from Ensenada to Guadalupe, 210 miles. So it takes a long time. There's no airport. You can't fly in. You gotta, you're going to take a boat. And most boats go about 10 miles an hour, 11 miles an hour. So you're dealing with a 20-hour 20, uh, trip. Uh, now, lest you think we're roughing it, this is actually the boat that I use. Um, and the other ones are very similar. And you'll notice, by the way, that's actually one of our submerged cages. It's not submerged right now, but that's, that's one of the cages ready to be, uh, to be lowered and someone's sitting there having lunch. But this is the Nautilus Bellamy. It's 135 feet long, 33 feet wide. As I said, goes about 10 miles an hour. It takes 28 passengers. Nice place. These are the individual rooms. We got places to hang out. So this is not exactly like being on a research boat you know, where, where you're cramped all into one bunk. They have the greatest camera tables in the world, and we had, a drone, we had two drones on board for this last trip, which was cool, because then we could shoot, shoot sharks from the air. Um, the water at Guadalupe is a little chilly. It's about, it was about 69 degrees or so when we were there, so you're wearing a wetsuit, and you need to stay down in the cages. You need to stay firm in the cages, so we use weight harnesses and a lot of weight. So even if you're not a diver, you can probably answer this question. Look at my four people here. What are they not wearing on their feet? Fins, okay? So th this is not a traditional scuba dive. We don't wear fins. We want to be rock solid on the bottom of this cage so that you're not really bouncing around too much. Because also, if you see a great white shark <sighs> and you inhale like that, your buoyancy changes by about eight to 10 pounds. And you'll just float up to the top of the cage and bang your head and you know, that's not a good thing. So we don't, we don't wear fins. We overweight ourselves tremendously. What else don't you see these guys wearing? A scuba tank. So how could we possibly be breathing? 
We can't. These four guys died after this. No, I'm kidding. Um, we're all on what's known as a hookah. A hookah is a scuba regulator. It's hooked up to a big compressor on the boat. So basically, you never run out of air, which is unless, of course, the compressor breaks down. Between dives, um, we get fed. We, of course, do our lucky shark uh, thing, and, and we have an inflatable shark on board to bring us even, even better luck. But again, it's about a 20-hour steam to get down there. So it's an overnight and a full day to get there, which is good because you have a lot of time then to prep, prep your gear. Most of the people on these trips, a lot of them are taking photographs, whether it's above or below the water. It also gives you time to correct mistakes you make. Can anybody see the mistake on this photographer's rig? The lens cap is still on. I can tell you, having flooded many cameras over the years, you don't want to take those off underwater. It's not a good thing. So anyhow, these are the cages, though, that we use. Um, on this particular boat, there are five different cages. Cages one, two, and three are submersible cages that go down about 30 feet. That's the hot thing now with, with looking at sharks. Get underwater. The sharks sometimes are down 30, 40 feet. Sometimes they're up at the surface. I mean, you just, you just really never know. Um, but these cages are about 18 feet tall. The top half is where the, um, the dive master, the crew person will be. The bottom half is where we are, are, are going to be. Cages four and five, oops, I went one too far. Four and five are what we call surface cages. The top of that cage floats at the surface. So if you were not a certified diver and wanted to do this, that's the cage you're going to be in. You're going to be standing in the bottom of the cage. Your head's going to be about three feet underwater, and you're going to be able to go nose to nose with the sharks while you're also breathing off of a, uh, a hookah. Now, take a look at the gap right there in the cage. That's our, our gap for the cameras. So, I mean, if you want to get out, you can. They tried if you have selfie sticks. They've asked you not to do selfie sticks because they said they had one group down, and every one of them had a selfie stick. They said they dropped the cage, and it looked like a sea urchin all of a sudden with all the selfie sticks out. Um, and if you want to go into the top of the cage where the gaps are bigger, and you actually have the top of the cage is open, and you really want to see what you got, you can go up in the top of the cage as well. But this is sort of what it looks like you know, from the cage. And, and why would anyone want to do this? Because it's really a really cool experience to be able to go nose to nose with this kind of an animal that you know, you've got a little bit of, of worry about is, is really, really neat. Again, everybody's on a hookah. Generally in the cages, you put three divers in and a dive master. So everybody has a corner. And you might take the right corner, or maybe you don't. You never know. And you can swap around a little bit. Um, but uh, and again, you get an idea here about how big these cages are. So I mean, this is, and that's the other thing. It, it's not a cheap trip. It's a massive operation logistically, because you want to keep divers safe. You want to, you know, make sure you, the, the sharks are safe as well, and you want to, you know, keep the interactions as natural as as you possibly can. So if this is not a great diagram, but this is the back end of the boat, so the steps are coming down, and that's the stern right across the side there. And so what we have there is we have cage one, same numbering, cage two and cage three are on winches. And they're basically going up and down all day long. Everything for the submerged dives is scheduled so that we know we're going to get X number of times in the water in a given day. I might be in cage one the first dive, cage two the second dive, cage three the third dive, and then I might pick up some surface cage dives on top of that in cage four and cage five. So they're, they're just sitting right up there. Um, and when we're ready to go and deploy, this is sort of what it looks like. It's also a really neat, serene place to be. And that's the surface cage there, ready for an, anyone to, to jump in. As I said, it is a scheduled type thing, because what you want to do is you want to get as much time as you can. But again, you want to give everybody else a chance. But the great thing is, with that number of cages, we generally have got like 20 people in the water at any given time. And so you know, you're really in and out, in and out, have time to look at photos. How do you get the sharks in close? We don't do any traditional chumming, but what we do is we use frozen tuna. It's in a burlap sack, and it sends out a scent trail as it starts to defrost. How do you get the t frozen tuna? You buy a big frozen tuna, and it's 7 in the morning with a chainsaw. You saw it apart. Literally a chainsaw. That's what you do. So let me take you down a little bit and, and show you what it's like. These are actually some of our aquarium divers going down. And you'll notice here, Behind the bubbles on the right-hand side of the picture, that would be a great white shark. So sometimes we drop down, and they're right there. And sometimes you drop down, and you got to wait a little bit. As I said, I've done 
in the neighborhood of, you know, 60, 80, whatever it is, cage drops there. I think maybe on two occasions. And you're down for 30, 40, in the submerged cage, you're down for 30, 40 minutes at a time. I think on maybe two occasions, I've not seen a shark at all. And on other occasions, they're there, they're there right away. And a lot of times, this is, this is what you get. You can see one of the other submerged cages in the back there. You can see we're bravely sticking our hands out in our, in our GoPro, uh, and the shark is swimming right in between. And a lot of times, what they're just doing is checking things out. Now, what you definitely will get a ton of, and, and guaranteed, are these enormous yellowtail all over the place. Because what are the yellowtail doing? They're also interested in the, the scent trail. And what will happen is, is that tuna defrosts, there's chunks of it you know, going out. So they're definitely getting some. But these are the biggest yellowtail I've ever, I've ever seen. Is anybody a spear fisherman in the crowd? You'd be very, very jealous. I mean, they're, I mean, they're enormous. Um, and what's interesting, again, as you look at some of those, that is not a hook in its eye. That's a parasite. And a lot of them have these, these parasites. So again, the other thing, even though we're going to look at great white sharks, you get other views of other animals that you might not normally get on a regular dive boat or whatever, because it's just a totally different situation. Bravest turtle in the world, <laughs> or the dumbest, I'm not sure which, because sharks like to eat turtles. But this is the guy that we are absolutely coming down to see. And this is what it looks like. I mean, other than a little color correction, I haven't doctored this photo or anything, anything like that. And you really do see the teeth just like that. Also, a lot of them have remoras hanging on the bottom, OK? Uh, not all of them, but and not all of them have necessarily a lot of remoras. Uh, this is also, by the way, the bravest remora. Can you see where the remora is right there? Or the dumbest. I'm not sure. I'm not sure which. But I mean, he is right by the mouth. So I don't know if he survived or not. Uh, here's one of our dive masters, Joel. So what Joel is doing is that's the tuna. So what the dive masters get to, it's really an awful job. They just basically jump on the tuna for like an hour while, while we're down. And they're not wearing shark socks when they're doing it either. Um, so as he's stomping on the tuna, it's defrosting a little bit. It's the, you know, shredding out a little bit. We get that scent trail out, and that's what the sharks are starting to, uh, to follow in. And so we get someone like that. It's also very interesting that when you get multiple sharks in, you look, try to gauge who's bigger, who, who's what. There's absolutely a pecking order, because occasionally we will lose a piece of tuna. And it'll start dropping out. We're in, we're in, the water we're in is about 200 feet deep. So also, we sit there and go, please do not let the cable on the cage break. Um, so the water's about 200 feet deep. We've lost tuna. And I've watched two sharks circling down. And all of a sudden, the small one looks at the big one and goes, no, 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 I'm, I'm good. You go, please, you go right ahead and take that. So it's, it's interesting. That's where we say we don't know if it's all social ordering or whatever. But there's some of that stuff absolutely, absolutely going, going on. So, you know, you're in the cage like that. Dive master's in the top, the or regular people in the bottom. Again, you can go up in the top with the dive master if you would, uh, would want to. But most of the time, the action's in the bottom. And a lot of times, these sharks, again, are going to be as curious about you as you are about them. There's a great way to tell who's really in for it. The first trip I had, I'm in this one cage over here, and we hear this bam. And when we came back up, we said, what happened? I said, oh, a shark rammed this other cage. So immediately, if your reaction is, man, I'm glad I wasn't in that cage, or if your reaction is, I wish I was in that cage, that sort of tells you what your, what your shark, shark uh, interest, interest is. I, I'm in the, please, be in the cage that rams, rams me. So right here, we've got a, a shark coming in, taking a look at, at two of our people. And that's what they'll do. They will keep on moving. They're not going to stop. But they just keep, keep on moving. And sometimes they'll be doing this. So I'm hanging out, and he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and he's coming closer, and I'm saying, okay, I'll back up a little bit. Um, and they'll come, they will come right up and veer off at the last second. I mean, at no time did I ever feel like I'm in any kind of danger or anything like that. Now, this is a cool thing. I did not take this shot. And the reason I did not take this shot is because I'm up there. Right place, right time. That was not me on this. This is actually two of our divers. This shark stuck his nose in the cage. That's my assistants, Marilyn and Betsy, in the cage there. He literally stuck his nose in the cage. Marilyn and Betsy are of the, yeah, put me in that cage. They were laughing. But it was really cool. Then, also not my shot, the same shark sort of veered off, circled around, and came up and bumped under Betsy's feet. 
oh, that's whatever, they're like, and then swam away. So, and again, I'm of course in the wrong place in the top. And why did I go into the top? Because I wanted to get a better view of the sharks, not knowing, you know, you never know. The other cool thing that happened, this is actually the guy with the camera, is Paul DeMeo, our dive safety officer here. The woman who looks like she's praying <laughs> is Jessica Rome, who we've never seen since his shot was to no, I, it, two of our other divers. Now take a look at how big that shark is. Now, I'm gonna take the Betsy Maryland shark and I'm gonna take the Paul and Jessica shark. I've made the cages the same size so you can see the size of the sharks. My belief, on the uh, left, we probably have a 14, 15 foot shark. On the right, I'm thinking that's about a 20 foot long shark. And that's about as big as they get. Because that shark, as it's going vertical, is pretty much the length of that 18 foot long or more uh, cage that we're in. And that you know, gives you, ooh, gives you great pause uh, when you realize there are big animals like that in the ocean. And you watch these guys, they turn on a dime, they will, you know, it, it's just fascinating just to watch them all the way around. If we don't have sharks, we carry alternate bait. <laughs> not really. Uh, these two kids were two kids not certified on the trip. They jumped in and they, I said, aren't you going to get cold? They said, no, we'll be okay. Would you take our picture? I said, okay, fine. So they, they had goosebumps by the, by the end of the thing. Not because they were seeing these guys, but just because they were cold. Again, the water's about 69 degrees. For those of you who don't dive, it's not terribly cold, but it's certainly not warm enough that you're going to last too long um, in, a, uh, in, in just your, your skin and your bathing suit. Um, interesting thing about this shark, look at that. Some sort of a tumor. How many of you, and I'll tell you right now, if you're going to raise your hand, it, I'm going to dispel the myth. How many of you have heard sharks can't get cancer? Not true. Oh, come on, you're all... Three people raise their hand. Um, anyhow, not, not true. Sharks do get cancer. They just don't get it very often. And if they do, their bodies have a way of dealing with it. But there's a great myth that sharks never get cancer. We don't know. We called this guy for obvious reasons. We called him Tumor. Um, don't know if that is cancerous or not. I was told after our trip here, this was, I think, in 2015, that they actually did get a sample from, I sort of was able, when he came very close, when I, I was able to sort of touch it. And it was just soft, pussy, whatever. It did not seem to bother him at all. But, you know, he's around that way. And, and here you take a look. There you see the tumor. Take a look at the eye. That is not a black, dead eye. That's an eye of, you know, at risk of sounding too, too new age about it, it's a sentient being who's checking you out who may come back and take another look. He's registering something in his brain, and there's an awareness there, and it just changes the way you might think of sharks if you ever felt they were just these mindless eating machines, because they are not, even though he's eating right there, I admit. But, but watch what happens. He goes in for, for the strike and bites up. I mean, it's just, again, the experience, I'm a foot away from where all this is going on with my wide angle lens uh, shooting. And again, from an experience standpoint, it's amazing to see the power, the grace, and everything else in an animal this size and get a good look at those, those teeth. And it's really cool to be able to see that from an up-close thing. So, you know, you spend 30 minutes or so in the cage. Cage comes up. Um, you sit around and, and uh, wait for the next chance to go down. We take plenty of water so we stay hydrated. They feed us. If you're really hungry, you can try to make a frozen tuna fish sandwich, which Marilyn was trying to do. But you can also observe the sharks from the surface. So here's just one shark going, going right on by. And what we do now is on one of the earlier slides. I'm not sure if I have it coming in again. What they do now is they have erected, and all the boats are doing this, what's called a pulpit. So it's an elevated thing that sticks out about six feet. And what they do now I guess you can argue it's a little cruel, but they have a, a buoy line. Under the buoy line is a piece of tuna. They throw it out 20, 30 feet, and they start pulling it in. So the shark starts falling. So what they're trying to do is lure the shark into the boat, and right as the shark is about to bite, because you're really not supposed to feed them directly, you pull it up, and the shark makes a close pass 
at the, um, at the cage. Now, how many of you have seen the video of the shark that got into the cage in Guadalupe? Everybody see? I was trying to get, I, could, I couldn't get a copy. I could. There was different boat, definitely bad cages, and they, were, I believe, were feeding the sharks directly. And the shark lunges at the thing and breaks the cage, breaks a bar in the cage. And this is probably a 15-foot great white. And all of a sudden, all you see is all this thrashing. And again, different boat than the one I use. And thankfully, they opened the top of the cage because about 30 seconds later, you, and if, if, if you've never seen this, when you go home tonight, Google it. Uh, just Google shark jumping out of cage. Um, you see the shark come leaping out of the cage. This is the scariest thing I've ever seen. Because <laughs> also, the dive master was about to go in and check on their diver that was still in the cage. The diver, by the way, had snuck out another area of the cage. He was just waiting outside. But the shark leaps out. But it's clear with this thing, even though the shark is inside the cage and could have said, hey, snack food, thank you very much, all he wants to do is get out. And again, that's the whole thing about a lot of, a lot of animals in particular, let alone sharks. A lot of times when you hear about animal quote unquote attacks, no, it's because the animal gets cornered, the animal gets scared, and the only way out is through you. In this case, the shark comes leaping out of the top. If you see the video, you will see a little bit of what looks like blood on the, on the gills. I was told the shark's okay. They've seen the shark again, but, it, but it's, a pretty, it's a pretty sobering sobering thought. So those are the stories you can, you can tell while you're waiting for your next, uh, your next dive. And speaking of our aquarium divers, Paul DeMeo in the middle, uh, you know, you're ready to go again. Again, if it's the type of thing where, like me, you're just jazzed by this stuff, you can't wait to get back in the water, and you'll make three or four cage dives in a day, and you'll jump in the submerged cage between dives. There's one time I was in the submerged dive, and the shark activity was so good, I came out of the submerged dive, thank goodness for charged batteries and big digital cards, and I jumped into the surface cage, and I think between the two, I spent a total of two hours underwater you know, without coming up and just shooting left and right and just watching. It's just, again, a fascinating experience. So there's, there's Adam going into the surface cage. And again, those are the kind of looks, you know, you're going to get. Sharks, you know, going away, they're going to circle back and come back at you. But it's also the type of thing if you, you know, I always like to say, if you don't bother to go look, you're never going to see what's down there. So we'll go look anytime we can. If we don't have the sharks around, we play with the bait, you know, and we make jokes with it. And we do Shakespeare. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio. Um, but we got, like I said, plenty of sharks, plenty of sharks down there. And, and the way, by the way, you ID them, uh, a lot of the ID is done, you know, like manta rays, we ID by their belly spots. Whale sharks, we ID by the spot patterns around their pectoral fins. Uh, the great whites, they're IDing by spot patterns on the gills. Um, and some of them, like tumor, is gonna be an easy one. But you know, if they have a piece of, sometimes a piece of fin might be missing, but some of that stuff may, grow back. This guy's got some bite marks on him. May or may not be okay uh, as an ID type thing. But again, the idea they're trying to do is ID as many sharks as they can, try to see who do they see on a regular basis, and learn something uh, about it, whether it's on a lay level or on a much more detailed scientific level. But it's a real, I mean, all I can tell you is going down to Guadalupe, it's a very, very cool experience and it's something that, like I said, I've done three times, I'm about to do it the fourth time, and it's really neat because how often can you go nose to chin with an apex predator like that? So that being said, this comes to the commercial alert. If anyone's interested, I'm going back September 1st through 6th on the same boat that we've been on, the Nautilus Bellamy. It ain't cheap, it's 3250 all in. And if you need information, you can check out my website, reefseekers.com, or you can email me directly, or if you just have questions that we don't get to tonight, you know, all you gotta do is remember my name, and remember they're both spelled with Ks, kencurtis at aol.com. And with that, I believe, Jerry, I made it in 40 minutes. He, gave, he put me under the gun.